had one of those things up in the top left, and we're in India. In India, you could celebrate the celebration of whatever god that is. Um, I think he's got eight arms. And generally, we call this idols. Over to the right is money, gold. In the middle, Calvin is worshiping the television. O great altar of passive entertainment, bestow upon me thy discordant images at such speed as to render thought impossible. And then he turns it on and sits there spellbound as the TV uh, does whatever it's doing. On the bottom left is a picture that I got from the internet. It says, Weekly Entertainer Idol. Their caption, not mine. He's a Chinese fellow. And the, and the bottom right is the soccer team. And it says, who is their biggest idol? So it's, it's not made up that people use that word for entertainers and sports stars and things like that. The God of the Bible, 1 Corinthians 8, 6. Let's read that together. There is only one God, the Father. Everything came from Him, and we live for Him. There is only one Lord, Jesus Christ. Everything came into being through Him, and we live because of Him. We'll read the, the back of this a little bit later. I think, I think in a lot of ways that, you know, talk about an entertainer, who's your idol in entertainment business, or who's your idol in sports, People are just using the word. I don't think they're saying, I go home at night and I bow down to it. But there are people who spend the economy of their home on clothes like their entertainer wears, or clothes and shoes like their football hero. And, you know, so it, it can get out of... And if they have the money, it's theirs to use it any way they want to. But there are people that just get absolutely carried away. Um, anyway, <clears throat> we're going to talk about a spiritual lesson taken from trees. On the board, we have a little bit of Psalm 1, verse 3. Uh, Blessed is he that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the day of judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the ungodly, the way of the ungodly shall perish. And so he's made an illustration about a tree there. And you, you can get the most outrageous things about where trees come from. You can go to a school like <clears throat> I taught at, where <clears throat> everything's supposed to be based, you know, and brought back to the Bible. And you can read about where trees came from. You can read about how trees originally were planted, blah, 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 in some little third grade book. And I'm pretty sure on the third day of creation, the Bible says God made trees that reproduced after their own kind. By our reckoning, we're about to begin a new year some 6,000 years later. Now, I've known devout Christian people that just, they can't deal with that 6,000 years. You know, well, it's roughly what the Bible works out if you follow all the years that are named in there. 
Isaiah chapter 44 presents a suitable lesson for a new beginning using trees as its basis. So um, the first two pages of this, this, the rest of this page and the next page are all from Isaiah 44. And he begins in the middle of that chapter by talking about bad and good uses for God's trees. And the bad use is making idols. And the good use is heating and baking and things like that. So let's read verses 13 through 15 there together. Carpenters measure blocks of wood with chalk lines. They mark them with pens. They carve them with chisels and mark them with compasses. They carve them into forms of people, beautiful people, so the idols can live in shrines. They cut down cedars for themselves. Then they choose fir trees or oaks. They let them grow strong among the trees in the forest. Then they plant cedars and the rain makes them grow. These trees become fuel for people to burn. So they take some of them and warm themselves. They start fires and bake bread. They also make gods from these trees and worship them. They make them into carved statues and bow in front of them. I, my dad was not much of a whipper. Just every, back then, everybody that was an adult carried a pocket knife just about. And out in the country, people whittled. And I had one uncle that could take a, a soft piece of wood, and in a few minutes, he would start making, you know, the outer form of a monkey or a, something like that out of it. But imagine if you could do that—you carve it out and then you <laughs> set it on the table and you bow down and worship. And God is not honoring that. He, you know, he's, he's saying it's kind of foolish. The next part of this, down to verse 20, is kind of evaluating the use of wood. Let's read verses 16 through 18 here. Half of the wood they burn in the fire. Over this half they roast meat that they can eat until they're full. They also warm themselves and say, Ah, we are warm. We can see the fire. But the rest of the wood they make into gods, carved statues. They bow to them and worship them. They pray to them, saying, Rescue us because you are our gods. They don't know or understand anything. Their eyes are plastered shut so they can't see, and their minds are closed. They can't understand. We'll go to page two. And part of that thinking about it is actually not thinking about it. And that, that's the answer to a lot of things that people do that don't make much sense. They just don't think about it. God is encouraging us to stop and think. So let's read verses 19 and 20. No one stops to think. No one has enough knowledge or understanding to say, I burned half of the wood in the fire. I also baked bread over its coals. I roasted meat and ate it. Now I'm making the rest of the wood into a disgusting thing and bowing to a block of wood. It is like eating ashes for food because they are deceived. Their own misguided minds lead them astray. They can't rescue themselves or ask themselves, isn't what I hold in my right hand a false God? And God is kind of ragging the Hebrews about it because they were practicing idolatry. We remember at Mount Sinai, when Moses stayed up in the mountain longer than they could abide, they said to Aaron, make us a god. 
And they came up with the idea of taking this gold and stuff that they had received for things that would be used later in the temple of God. And they had Aaron make it into a golden calf. And he carved it and shaped it and got it all right. And they worshipped it and said, These be our gods that brought us out of the land of Egypt. They knew those things the day before were earrings and gold rings and stuff the Egyptians had given them. You can't make sense out of that. It's not a reasoning kind of thing that you can hand make your own God and then ask it to worship you, ask it to rescue you. The, the, the last part of Isaiah 44 about this is verses 21 through 26. And essentially it says three things, that God can redeem us, that only God created us, and that God exposes falsity and confirms truth. So let's read those verses. Remember these things, Jacob. You are my servant Israel. I formed you. You are my servant Israel. I will not forget you. I made your rebellious acts disappear like a thick cloud, and your sins like the morning mist. Come back to me, because I have redeemed you. Sing with joy, you heavens, because the Lord has done this. Rejoice, you deep places of the earth. Break into shouts of joy, you mountains, you forests, and every tree in them. The Lord has redeemed the Jacob. He will display his glory in Israel. The Lord redeemed you. He formed you in the womb. And you stop a minute and look at the contrast between that and what the Hebrews were doing at the time Isaiah was prophesying. They were growing trees off of God's reign, trees that God created to produce after their kind. And they were growing them, cutting them, baking them, cooking, warming the house, and then carving them into images and setting them up and say, these be our gods. Deliver me. And God has made this real strong case of witnesses. I made you. I am your. The way it works is God makes you. You don't make God. And I made you. I redeemed you. Even when you're rebellious, I can redeem you. And when I do, you need to sing with joy and, 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 and shouts of joy. The world around you will shout with joy because you've been redeemed from your wrongdoings. B, on page 2, toward the bottom, only God created us. Verse 24, let's read that. This is what the Lord says. I, the Lord, made everything. I stretched out the heavens by myself. I spread out the earth all alone. When people don't accept that God is telling us the truth in the book of Genesis, chapter 1 and chapter 2 about the creation, then they come to passages like this. What are they going to do? They've already said the story of creation by God in six days is a, uh, an accommodation for ignorant people or, or all the kind of excuses they can make so they can have millions of years there. And then you come to this. And the Lord says, I, the Lord, made everything. I stretched out the heavens by myself. I spread out the earth all alone. How can they believe this? if they wouldn't believe Genesis 1. So now, every time in the Bible, God says something like, I made everything by the power of my mind. Oh, no, no, no. What's happening to what's supposed to be their faith? They can't just believe and trust God. So on the one hand, I so, said, well, yeah, there were all these millions of years that scientists talk about, and blah, 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 blah. I think some, you know, then they come and say, oh, well, yeah, I believe in God, my, my Savior, and Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. All that other stuff certainly doesn't agree with God's Word. If God wasn't happy about them setting up a false God, 
carving it out of wood and saying, you're my God, redeem me, rescue me. If that made him mad, he said, I, the Lord, am a jealous God. How can he be happy when people get a very sophisticated thing that in fact says, God didn't make nothing? And then the people turn around and say, but we want to trust the Lord and call on him for salvation. Using the illustration he made about the ashes, it's like people eating ashes and saying, we're having some food that you want some. I've got some stuff people made up. It doesn't even claim it'll do any good for you. Do you believe this? It won't redeem your soul. It won't cause you joy. It won't let your sins be forgiven. It won't promise you heaven. But we think everybody ought to believe this stuff over here. Ashes. And then see Isaiah 44, 25, and 26. Let's finish these verses then. I cause the signs of false prophets to fail and make fools of fortune tellers. I make wise men retreat and turn their knowledge into foolishness. He confirms the word of his servant and fulfills the plan of his messengers. So in the great sense that God is in charge of everything, there's a passage that more or less says, I am God. I made good and evil. He doesn't pass the buck to anybody. But he does expose false prophets. For years at the all those years I taught at the academy, within a year or two, I came up with the idea, I bought these things of these little yellow journalism things they have at grocery stores in the fall telling about how the world was going to end or Dr. Fogus or something believes that this and that and the other. And, and then you had, around this time of year, they would come out with people who forecast what's going to happen in the next year. And I would keep those and use them the next year. I said, well, you know, last year, this woman, who's, everybody says she's a fortune teller. She really knows. And it was the most, it was, looked so foolish. One of them said that Ronald Reagan's wife was going to run off with, I forget who it was, one of her predictions for the year. But God says, I cause the signs of foolish prophets to fail and make fools of fortune tellers. Arguably, they make fools of themselves. Because they claim the power that only God has as their own. And yet there's people that will give them money and all sorts of stuff to get their own fortune told. I make wise men retreat and turn their knowledge into foolishness. Right now, we're in the middle of this stuff with COVID. And as near as I can tell from everything I've read, COVID was developed through the great scientists of this world. Through their idea that they could control and make things happen the way they wanted to. And here we sit in COVID. Did they intend to make COVID? No, I don't think that. But I think their wisdom did become foolishness. Because a lot of those noted scientists that dealt in this very thing died when all this stuff broke out. And so man is still, after all this time and all the things that he thinks he understands, he's still in the hands of God Almighty. And their wisdom can still be turned into foolishness. We get lots of benefits, yes. But we get lots of bad things, too. So, let's look at some lessons, some things to think about concerning what Isaiah talked about. Lesson number one on page three. No one is to worship idols. There's not any exceptions to that. God didn't say, I can have a little click over here that worships idols. Um, I forget just where it is in the, in the Bible. 
probably Jeremiah, but God says, you go to the temple and sacrifice an animal to me in the morning, and in the afternoon you go to the hills and sacrifice to your idols. That's kind of not God's plan. That's not God's plan at all. Nobody is supposed to worship idols. Exodus 20, 3 through 6, from the Ten Commandments. Let's read that. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make to you any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down yourself to them, nor serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. That ugly thing that we looked at, in the top left of this picture. I, I don't call that beautiful. You don't have to be beautiful. But can, do you think this thing delivers mercy to thousands of people? I checked you can buy one of them cut out of brass for about $1,500. And you know, it's molded out of brass, probably about that big, $1,500. Uh, and then what would you do? Would you sit it there and say, would you save my soul? Would you feed me? Would, would you keep me from getting COVID? God said, you just as well eat ashes and think you're eating food. No one is supposed to worship idols. On the back of this, we're going to read Psalm 115. 1 through 15. Psalms 115, verses 1 through 15. Let's begin. Don't give glory to us, O Lord. Don't give glory to us. Instead, give glory to your name because of your mercy and faithfulness. Why should other nations say, where is their God? Our God is in heaven. He does whatever he wants. Their idols are made of silver and gold. They were made by human hands. They have mouths, but they cannot speak. They have eyes, but they cannot see. They have ears, but they cannot hear. They have noses, but they cannot smell. They have hands, but they cannot feel. They have feet, but they cannot walk. They cannot even make a sound with their throats. Those who make idols end up like them. So those, everyone who trusts them, Israel, trust the Lord. He is your helper and your shield. Descendants of Aaron, trust the Lord. He is your helper and your shield. If you fear the Lord, trust the Lord. He is your helper and your shield. The Lord, who is always thinking about us, will bless us. He will bless the descendants of Israel. He will bless the descendants of Aaron. He will bless all those who fear the Lord, from the least important to the most important. May the Lord continue to bless you and your children. You will be blessed by the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Millions and millions of people in this world today 
worship idols. Marilyn and I saw a documentary years ago about a fellow who went over to India and he was interviewing people personally about their idols and how they felt about it and stuff. And there was a woman. This woman worked at a, what we would call a house of ill repute, where women are made available to the rich men. And when she came out from the little apartment where she lived with her, maybe her mother and her child or something, there was a little idol sitting out on the porch. And she stopped and she made washings and she bowed down to it and stuff. And he says, doesn't that seem odd to you that you're worshiping your idol before you go to this house? And she says, no, he wouldn't want me to be poor. She says, I make as much in a month there as most people could make in a year working in a store. If you want a real clear picture of why so many people can't come to grips with the truth, that's probably one of them. Because the truth won't let them have, won't let me have everything I want the way I want when I want it. So if I can scheme out some way to have a God that will let me have all those things and it's to be okay with Him, wow! Except for one thing, the God who made us says it doesn't work that way. Lesson two, <clears throat> greed is also idolatry. Avarice, greed, uh, covetousness, um, Colossians 3, first, verse 5. Let's read that on the middle of page 3. Therefore, whatever is of the evil world, put that to death in you. Sexual immorality, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and greed, which is idolatry. Now, it's careful. Wanting something that's lawful is not a sin. It's wanting it so badly, I'll sin to get it. That's the easiest definition I know of covetousness. Wanting something so badly that I'll sin to get it. Colossians 3, then, verses 8 and 9. Let's read that, and then we'll read Galatians 5, 19 through 21, just for these little excerpts. Anger, hot tempers, hatred, cursing, obscene language, and all similar sins don't lie to each other. And then illicit sex, perversion, promiscuity, idolatry, drug use, hatred, rivalry, jealousy, angry outbursts, selfish ambition, conflict, factions, envy, drunkenness, and wild partying. We can be greedy to pursue any such sins which are forbidden to us as is idolatry. If we think about that, the we don't have to just be covetous for money to be greedy. Uh, there's the sin uh, What's the sin of grossly overeating? Uh, gluttony. Gluttony. There's a sin in the Bible called gluttony. It's not just that you ate too much today or something like that. It, 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 it's like the picture I saw of King Henry VIII one time in a movie. And he's just taking the food and biting all of this and just gorging himself and he's making you know, it like this. And he's just gorging himself, throwing some cat. Give me some more, you know. He's be that way about that, can be that way about drunkenness. Well, a lot of these sins can be addictive. Don't you know people that are angry all the time, can't get enough of bad-mouthing people and carrying on? People that use obscene language just endlessly look like they want to find a reason to use it. The same can be true 
in the passage in Galatians 5, look how many of them are crooked, illicit sex, perversion, promiscuity, idolatry, right there in the next with them, see, drug use, hatred, rivalry, jealousy, angry outbursts, selfish ambition. Um, they took a, a, a survey, people, when they were developing kind of a, more into a science, the science of sociology, they did an experiment after World War II, and people came back and kind of settled into their life again, and they found that in the South, one of the ways business worked at that time was that people generally thought the way that you got up the ladder of success was you took the guy that was ahead of you, or the woman that was ahead of you, and you grabbed hold of their pants, pulled them off the ladder so you could go up higher. Is that what God would want us to do? But it's what a greedy person would. I worked one time when I was in college at a little hamburger place. And the manager went on vacation for a week and the whole time he was gone, the assistant manager lied to the supervisor about the guy. And so when the guy came back, he was fired. And guess who got to be the manager? Why, the assistant manager. And he was a lot worse than the other fellow. We can be greedy to pursue any of these kinds of sins and they're as forbidden to us as idolatry and are presented right in the, in the context with idolatry and greed. Millions and millions just of Americans do seem to worship greed. What you and I were talking about this morning, George, about that fellow won $150,000 for the rights to his photograph. Smacks of greed. I, I took a picture. Uh, I didn't get a dime. <laughs> Page four. Lesson. I think I, oh, my daughter will be on me again. No idea. I did it again. Lesson one was. No one is to worship idols. Lesson two is greed is also idolatry. Lesson three is the danger of misplaced love. And you'll see, I think, how this relates to the subject of greed. This is in, from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Let's read that. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men will be lovers of themselves only, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving of family, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, not loving what is good, traitors, headstrong, having been puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power, and from these people turn away. So if we think that whole passage, he's not talking about this guy over here that just lives a horrible and godless life. That's still all wrong and sinful. He's talking about people that have a form of godliness. Some form they claim to worship God, and I imagine he means God Almighty. Yet what they love is themselves. They love money. They boast about it, see? They boast about themselves. They're proud of the wrong kind of pride. They're blasphemers. They don't give credit to God. They're disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. They don't even love their own family. They're unforgiving. They lie about people to hurt them. They don't have any self-control. They're brutal. They don't love what is good. They're traitors, headstrong, puffed up, lovers of pleasure, rather than love 
lovers of God, and yet they hold to a form of godliness. And God says, turn away from these people. Why? Because if I hang out with them, likely I'm going to be tempted. Because I said, well, this is a godly person. I'll be like him or I'll be like her. And I'll adopt whatever of these suit me. But there's a tremendous danger in not understanding love as the God who said, God is love and he that loveth love. You know, God is love. That's where we learn about love from him. He loved us. He gave his son to die for us, to save us. That's a very sacrificial type of love. And he writes about how husbands love your wives as your own selves. You know, he writes about how things should be. And these people don't want that because they can't see outside of themselves. So there's a tremendous danger of getting into greed just by misplacing our love. Lesson four is God's people are to be holy. Worshiping, serving, and obeying God. That's how that passage in Isaiah 44 ended up talking about he can redeem you. He's good. Let everybody rejoice. God is redeeming you. He can... Put away your rebellious acts of the past and things. 1 Peter 1, 15 and 16 under Lesson 4. Let's read that. But because the God who called you is holy, you must be holy in every aspect of your life. Scripture says, be holy because I am holy. My brother was a great Bible scholar. He had degrees from these colleges about that. He was a preacher in the church his whole adult life. But he couldn't get around this verse because to him it meant be as holy as God is. It doesn't say that, does it? It says God is holy. Be holy. Here's God in his holiness and here's the devil and all the wickedness of the world what am I supposed to try to be? I'm supposed to be holy over here where God is because that's who he is and that's what he's all about instead of being half put out the door into the world of sin and being half holy or being half-heartedly holy. Romans 6, 2 and 3. Let's read that together. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Don't you, I'm supposed to say, don't you know, I'm sorry, don't you know that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. We're to serve our Savior, Jesus Christ, and not the idols of this world. One of the stories in the Old Testament is when the people of Israel were coming out, trying to finish their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. And they came, and this foreign king called Balaam, Balak, Balak called Balaam to curse the people of God, and he, he wound up not doing it. In that story, later, when they came, or after that story, when they came up by them, they came up with a better idea that that false prophet came up with. Send the women out of the temple, out of the idolatrous temple. And they thought that relations with those women would draw them right into the temple of idols, which it did. And those women regarded, were regarded as part of their service to their idolatrous God. They're expected to do this. And as a result, I think it was something like 15,000 of the people of Israel died in God's judgment. 
We're not to worship and serve idols. We're to worship and serve God Almighty. There is none of them. Revelation 22, 14. Let's read that together. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. So there, that tree of life that was in the garden with Adam and Eve, God didn't want them to eat of after they ate of the tree of knowledge. Where's it going to be? It's going to be in heaven. And so the God who originally made trees 6,000 years ago, whenever he ends the world, the people who have done his commandments according to his word are the people who are going to have the right to eat of the tree of life and live forever. And it's a beautiful picture of that in the book of Revelation. So as we approach a new year, we're hopefully, God willing, we're fortunate enough to last out this year, then we ought to think not so much that we ourselves would be tempted to take that ugly thing that we had a picture of and worship it or carve something out of a piece of wood and put it on the table and say, Bless me, redeem me, rescue me, for you're my God. But that we might not be tempted to go in the direction of some of those other things where people tend to put the whole power of their being not toward holiness of God, but toward, they treat, say, American football almost like it was a religion. And everybody they admire is great in that sport. Or, same true with the entertainment world. They don't just watch entertainment, but like to be entertained. It's way past them for that. And we don't want to go there. We don't want to direct our lives so that money is more important than God. That, that we would do sinful things in order to make more money because then we would whatever. And greed would rule our lives. And God said, greed is idolatry. So it's a good time to reflect on our lives and just make sure we're on the right track. Sometimes we have to do a little housekeeping. We say, whoops, I got weak over here. I didn't mean to, but I was tending to this. And I got, oh, we better go and clean this up a little bit. That kind of thing. It's easy in this world to take on the ways of a wicked world, but it's, it's not what God would ever have of us. He is holy. He's so holy that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus the Christ, the very and only Son of God, came to this earth to rescue us and redeem us. And he lived among people and died for us to fulfill that purpose. And, and that's where religiously our mind needs to be attached. We need to hold on to it tightly. And whenever we see the wickedness of the world encroaching in our lives, we need to watch out for it. We need not to yield to it. Uh, to me, one of the most difficult things that I deal with is where he said, love your enemies. <laughs> Pray for them that despitefully used you. We were, Marilyn and I watched an hour of a movie called Ben Her. Ben Her. And in it, this man was so full of hate but then he, he, he met Christ unintentionally and Christ healed his family from leprosy and, and his life was renewed. Well, back then those kind of things did happen. But we don't have, you know, like a miraculous thing to rescue us from the dangers of hatred or the dangers of misplaced love or the dangers of alcohol addiction or drug addiction and so forth. We have to fight some of those battles. We can pray to God. We can ask for 
his will that he help us and strengthen us. We can see what's available around us to overcome those things. And the end result it has to be what we want. And if we want to follow God, he's our creator and he's our blessed. He'll redeem us. He'll, he'll rescue us. He'll sometimes just draw us back to keep us from plunging into places we don't need to go. So a very strong lesson about trees. Not to make trees, not only to, to take them and cut them down and warm the house and eat food and stuff, but not to take the rest of it and make idols to worship. Neither do we need to take anything else in the world and make it our idol. If we can help you with your soul's salvation, we're going to sing number 32. Let's stand while we sing. Satan's waiting there for me, he better go slow. Just like Adam and Eve so long ago. There's a tree with good fruit. God says no, better go slow, better go slow. Satan says if you want it, get it right now. If you like it, better do it anyhow. It won't hurt news to know, but God says no. songs of praise and to worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray the Lord that you will watch over uh, Sister Betty and Sister Linda and any of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ that may be suffering. We pray the Lord that you will be with them, that you will provide them with comfort and that you will return us, return them to us here at this congregation and for those at their congregations. We thank you, dear Lord, for allowing Brother Ed to be with us again this morning to guide us in the teaching and understanding of your word. We pray that today's lesson, dear Lord, has renewed and strengthened our faith and spirit and our knowledge of your word. We pray, the Lord, that you will be with him and his families, the members of this congregation, that you will watch over us, and that you will protect us, and that you will be with us and allow us to return here on next Lord's Day. We 
pray the Lord that as Christians that we can somehow inspire others to seek you out through our actions and deeds and we thank you for all that you do for all of your children dear Lord and we pray that it will continue we thank you dear Lord for the sacrifice that was made by your son and our Savior who died on the cross for the remission of our sins so that we may have an avenue of forgiveness this prayer we say in Jesus name in the name of the Heavenly Father Amen